Okay, welcome everyone again. Welcome to Living Well. I want to welcome everyone this today to another program of Living Well, where we enjoy the journey to better health and holiness from heaven. So welcome. Today, I, before we start, I just want to do a quick disclaimer. Remember, this presentation is for educational purposes only. Info, information shared is based on research and personal experience and also from, from biblical scripture. Our goal is to educate you on the topic, not to assess, diagnose, prescribe, or treat any medical conditions. If you have a specific condition, or situation in which you are concerned, you are encouraged to seek advice from your personal physician. Again, this is for educational purposes only, and the presentation is intended to increase your awareness on the topic that we're going to present today. Today, we are going to be talking about gut health. Gut health matters for good health. Our presenter today is Josephine Johnson, our registered nutritionist. She is going to be presenting to us our topic. And without any further ado, we are going to have Josephine start with her presentation. Get pens and paper out, ready to take notes. If you have any questions, you can put it in the chat um, and we'll try and answer it at the end of our presentation. So Josephine, you can start. No, I just stop sharing. Um, I need to stop sharing. Yeah. Um, stop share. Okay. Okay. So go ahead. Okay. Is it up? Yes, we can see. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It's always a pleasure talking to you about health because that's my passion. I want to thank Emily and Dr. Sankey and all the participants for participating in this venture. Gut health. Is it important? Okay, my thing is not. Uh, it's not it's not moving. You have there's a there's a little button there, that arrow on your computer that will allow you. There you go. There's the arrow on your computer, Josephine, at the bottom of the computer. That allows you, to, yes. There you go. So this afternoon, we are going to be looking at the definition of gut health and the gut microbiome. Names of some of the bacteria in the gut and what they do. Parts of the intestines and their functions. Gut health and, in, and the immune system. We're going to look at the inside of the small intestines some adverse conditions of the gut, things that can destroy our gut health and fixing the gut. So gut health describes the function and the balance of bacteria of many parts of the GI tract. Organs such as the esophagus, the stomach, intestines, they all work together to allow us to eat and digest our food without any discomfort. But unfortunately, some persons don't have that privilege. About 70 million people in the US alone have digestive issues. But health is important because it influences our well-being. It can impact our immune system, increase our risk for chronic diseases, and 
prevent our bodies from breaking down our food so we can have it for energy. Lots of studies are going on now which demonstrate the link between gut health, the immune system, our mood, our mental health, our autoimmune diseases, endocrine disorders, skin conditions, and cancer. Gut, so we can see now that gut health, from what we just read, affects the health of many, if not all, organ systems in the body. So it is foundation to our health. We have heard this name, Hippocrates, I don't know if I'm saying it right, the father of modern medicine who said, all disease begin in the gut. Doctors are now finding out that when anybody comes to them, those who are really interested in our well-being, they have to go to the root of the problem. And in most cases, they check out the gut when we have our chronic conditions. Let's take a brief look at our digestion. We start to eat the food. In our mouth, it goes down our esophagus into the stomach. And from the stomach, it goes to something called the duodenum. If we go back here, we'll see, no, it's not that. But it's a C-shaped thing leading down to the stomach towards the intestines or the duodenum. There you have the, the continuation of the breaking down of our food because our food starts to break down even in our mouth with our saliva and the enzymes there. And then in the stomach, it also does that. Then it goes from the adenum to the jejunum and that's where the majority of our, our, our absorption takes place and it goes to the ileum and the ileum absorbs remaining nutrients into the bloodstream. It also makes sure that much of the bacteria from the colon doesn't swim back up into the intestines, which we talk about later. And then the colon absorbs any struggling nutrients and extracts water and other minerals. And then we excrete the waste. So our intestines are fully involved in the digestive process. And that's why we have to take care of it. Mm. So the small intestine is where food should go to its final breakdown. That means the proteins we eat should now be amino acids. The fats we eat into fatty acids and the carbohydrates into sugars. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the gut microbiome. Nice fancy word, but it's just me <coughs> talking about the bacteria that live in the intestines. 300 to 500 different species of bacteria in our GI tract, which amounts to 100 trillion bacteria in our GI tract. <coughs> I thought to write out the number because I was trying to say, what is 100 trillion? So that's the amount of bacteria in our gut. And if we scoop them together and weigh them, they're going to come to about 4.4 pounds. And without them, we wouldn't survive. Some of them are harmful to our health, while many are incredibly beneficial and even necessary to a healthy body. 
one Dr. E.M. Squig Quigley, in his study, trusted sores and gut bacteria in the Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, said having a wide variety of these good bacteria in, in your gut can enhance your immune system function. It can also improve symptoms of depression, help combat obesity, and provide numerous other benefits. So our gut bacteria can be very, very beneficial to us. So I went about and I got this picture of the gut and some of the bacteria. We have on the left, normal, and on the right, opportunistic. These bacteria have certain relationships with us. Some of them are mutual relationships, which you, the bacteria benefit from you and you benefit from the bacteria. Some of them are opportun opportunistic. They're there and they're waiting for an occasion of sickness, ill health, or some debilitating disease to occur for them to start to make matters even worse. So we have to keep the normal bacteria up so that they can counteract the effects of the opportunistic bacteria. So we have some of them here. Enterococcus fecalis, that's a good bacteria. These are the good one, the normal ones. Bifidobacterium, the E. coli, and the lactobacilli. But all of these in themselves have <coughs> different species. They can be like probiotics, help modulate our immune system, heal and repair, absorption of vitamins, and they also produce vitamins and minerals, help with our immunity, protect against carcinogens, food digestion, prevents growth of harmful bacteria. Those are the good ones. And then we have some which are good and bad. Um, some of them, the nurses can, can may know about like MRSA and all those things. Some of them cause diarrhea. Some of them cause severe sickness. As I said, if conditions are favorable in the body for them to cause sickness, they will cause sickness and some of them can cause food poisoning. We often hear them recording stuff from the supermarkets that don't eat this, don't eat that because it is contaminated with bacteria. And one of them is uncooked chicken. So when you're cooking your food, make sure that they are cooked properly. So I just went through the major rules and we have some more here. And uh, it is so overwhelming. These things can do wonderful jobs in our bodies, but we have to make sure that they are there and that the bad bacteria, bacteria don't overwhelm the, the good bacteria. They take part. I mean, toxic from our bodies. They maintain our gut walls, they break down our food, and help the gut to develop properly. So, thinking about bacteria in the gut may sound negative, but these bacteria are very, very beneficial to us. So there are several ways an unhealthy gut might manifest itself. So as we go through, I want you to look at them and see if you're experiencing any of these conditions. 
maybe not on a one time scale, but if you have it constantly, if you have gas and bloating, if you have constipation, diarrhea, heartburn, if you have a balanced gut, it would have less difficulty processing food and eliminating waste if your gut is balanced. But if it is not balanced, you're going to experience some of those I just mentioned there. A high sugar diet can upset your, your gut bacteria. Added sugars can decrease the number of good bacteria in your gut. So eating your fruit like that, instead of making it into jam or whatever, is good. Because when you add sugar to what you're eating and the processed foods that we eat sometimes, this can decrease the number of good bacteria in the gut. And when this happens, we tend to have cravings, increased cravings for sugar, which can damage our gut even more. So the refined sugar, and this is Emmeline's baby, the high fructose corn syrup, all these have been linked to increased inflammation in the body. And inflammation in the body can lead to the starter to several diseases and even cancer. So watch your sugar intake. If you realize that you're losing weight without losing or gaining weight without changing your diet or exercise habits, that can be a sign of an unhealthy gut. An imbalanced gut can impair your body's ability to absorb nutrients. If your gut is not imbalanced, you're not going to be able to, to absorb your nutrients. You won't be able to regulate your blood sugar and store the fat. And weight loss may, may be caused by small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which I'll touch on later, while weight gain can be caused by insulin resistance or the urge to overeat due to decreased nutrient absorption. Your body is not being energized, so you, you feel hungry and you have the urge to eat and eat because your gut is dysfunctioned. Not enough sleep or you're always tired. That's, those things can cause an unhealthy gut. So we need to go to bed at a certain time, by a certain time, take off the lights, put down the, the broom and the mop and leave the clothes in the laundry and take our shower and go to bed and get our adequate sleep because the majority of the body's serotonin is a hormone that affects mood and sleep is produced in the gut. So if you don't sleep and, you, and this hormone doesn't get to work, you can impair your ability to sleep well. Skin conditions like eczema may be related to a damaged gut. Inflammation in the gut caused by a poor diet or food allergies may cause increased leaking of certain proteins out into the body, which can in turn irritate the skin and cause conditions such as eczema. So if your skin is bothering you, you have things on your skin or whatever, you have to check, get the doctor to check your gut, see if everything is in order there. You can also have autoimmune conditions where the body attacks itself rather than the harmful invaders. So we have to be aware of these things so we can pinpoint and say, oh, maybe my gut is not working well. So that is why I'm having these things and get yourself checked out 
as soon as possible. There are some persons who may exhibit food intolerances, like they may not be able to tolerate gluten or dairy or soy, and then they end up with gas and diary, abdominal pain and nausea. And all these two can point toward an unhealthy gut. Now we have a, a picture here. The first one is a picture of the inside of our intestine. And you have those little things look like fingers. If you put your fingers up, maybe you can do that while I speak, put your hand up and put your fingers close together. They call them finger-like projections because that's how they look. The, the second picture looks like finger, doesn't it? So if you take down one of your finger, you will have a space between there. That is what goes on in your intestine when these finger-like projections called villi, they are damaged. And it shows you in the third picture of a damaged villi. The first, the second one is a normal one. And the, the third one is when they're damaged. You see they are broken, they are spaced. And I will show you further how that is. But the first picture shows you the road down our small intestine lined with those villi. And if, if we can remember back in our young days when we used to kill goat and cow when we begin to clean the intestine, didn't you used to come across something like this in from the gut? Mm -hmm. Emily, anybody? Yes, I think we call it stripe. Yeah, yeah, stripe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm sure that you have seen this kind of thing in the intestines of the animal. These are the villi. On top of the villi, we have other stuff called enzymes that help with the absorption of our food. So take a look at how your inside looks, your intestine looks. Um, so when those little finger-like projections are destroyed, is because of some sort of food sensitivity or food intolerance that goes on for quite a period of time. Some persons don't even know that they are allergic to certain things until <clears throat> the condition has gone probably, I won't say too far, but when they get so sick and then they find out that well, the doctor says that whatever test they will do, one of them is a breath, a breath test they can do. They do that and they find out, well, you're not supposed to eat this because it's making you sick. No gluten, no nuts, no dairy. Because if you continue eating them, you're going to damage those finger-like projections in your gut and put yourself at risk for something we call leaky gut, which I will talk about. So, as I said earlier, all of these finger leg projections, they have their own job to do in digestion. So, sometimes doctors can tell, tell you, you're allergic to this because of whatever, whichever part of the intestine is damaged, they can know. It's because you ate soy or because of allergic to lactose and all of that. So wherever an intestine is damaged, some doctors can tell you, don't eat that because your intestine is damaged. And that is, to me, very fantastic. So dysbiosis is the disruption of the microbiome, the gut bacteria. And undesirable health conditions can res result. Like metabolic syndrome, 
the cardiovascular disease, irritable bowel syndrome. We can have the C. diff or dermatitis. So it's only some of the conditions that can result when our gut is disrupted. Gut health destroyers, alcohol can do that in excess, but you know, we say no alcohol. Antibiotics that doctors like to prescribe when we have some infection, they can't distinguish between the bad or the good bacteria. So sometimes they keep both. Our Advil, our leave, ibuprofen, and motrin, we call them NSAIDs, the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. We take up for pain or other things. These can destroy our gut bacteria. If we don't exercise regularly, our gut bacteria can be destroyed because we need to exercise, as we see in the other one. When we overexercise, it reduces the blood flow to the intestines. So we have to exercise in moderation because exercising, especially aerobic exercise, it sends oxygen to our intestines through the blood because oxygen is carried in the blood. If we overexercise, the, the body will focus more on getting oxygen to your muscles, etc., and forget about the intestines and it can start to deteriorate. Vegetable oils and margarine, the trans fat in these things can damage the gut, the gut bacteria. Cigarette smoking increases the risk for Crohn's disease, gallstones, peptic ulcer, etc. Not enough sleep also can destroy our gut bacteria because it is believed that the gut has its own circadian rhythm. Those who do shift work and eating late at night, those things can have negative effect on our gut bacteria. The plastic that we use can do that. Too much stress can destroy our gut bacteria. If you don't eat a, um, a variety of foods, our gut bacteria can be destroyed. And lack of prebiotics in our diet can also destroy our gut bacteria. So when the GI tract barrier is intact, a healthy gut is maintained. And if you look at um, this picture, you see that the, the, they are very close together. So they are intact here. But when it is damaged, like this other one over here, this is leaky and inflamed. This first one is a normal tight junction. They're close together. But when it is, it is, when it has these spaces between it, it put us at risk for developing leaky gut syndrome. Our GI tract every day has to make more decisions than the rest of the body's immune system makes in its lifetime. And each of, each of those finger-like projections, as I said, absorb different micronutrients, meaning vitamins or minerals or proteins that will go through that particular area. So when the gut walls lining is worn down by things like too much sugar, yeast overgrowth, alcohol, stress, or the NSAIDs, this can cause a tight junction in the intestinal wall to loosen up, allowing the bad stuff to leak through and you end up in leaky gut. Our oh, gut leaks because of the space between there. 
things who go to there that are not supposed to go to there. For example, proteins, when you eat your protein, it is broken down into peptides and then into amino acids. But when it goes into the intestine and it doesn't reach the amino acid state and your gut is leaky, those peptides can go through that those spaces there and cause havoc, inflammation sets in, perfect storm is set up. And it is also believed that our brain has something similar, a barrier, the blood brain barrier. And these peptides, when they pass through here, they can also pass through <clears throat> sorry, the barrier of the brain and cause havoc in your, in your body. So we have to keep our gut intact. So if we can end up with digestive issues, in, increased junk food cravings, fluctuation, fluctuating waste, disinfection, fatigue, mood swings and headaches, etc. So we have to keep our gut intact. So our immune system is a complex collaboration that we have to work together. The organs have to work together to fight off invading germs that can cause harm to the body. <clears throat> so in addition to breaking down food, the digestive tract is integral in protecting the body from toxins and other harmful substances. That's because the walls of the digestive tract act like, a, like barriers controlling what enters the bloodstream that's later transported to the organs. But if the gut is leaky, or we may say hyperpermeable, Peptides are making their way into the bloodstream. Gluten and casein from dairy are two peptides that easily cross this barrier. And when they get into the bloodstream, trouble breaks out. And the immune system is ready to send out the attack to get rid of these peptides because they're not supposed to be there. They see them as foreigners. So they're going to call up the immigration in the body to get rid of the foreigners and inflammation the setting. And they, do, they will do the same for a virus or bacteria, but only for food particles. So all the other virus systems are also eaten. The gut brain connection. And we have to be aware of what goes on in the body what can leak through the intestinal wall or to the blood brain barrier so that it will encourage us to keep our intestine, intestinal wall intact. So most of our immune system is in the gut. And we have something called the pious patch, which Dr. What's her name? The gynecologist who spoke to us the other day. Talk about the pious patch. Dr. Perot. 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 In this pious patch, the immune cells are there and they monitor what's coming in. They're, they're like surveillance, they're like police looking for things that are coming in that are not supposed to be there. And they will communicate this to other cells throughout the entire immune system so that they can get rid of them. So we want to fix the gut. We want to swap the bad bacteria for the good bacteria. So eat a fiber-rich diet whole foods diet, eat your greens, your fruits, 
all of these are high in fiber, your beans, high fiber, wholesome food, limit sugar. As much as possible, cut out the processed foods and limit your animal fats and your animal protein. Avoid the use of antibiotics, acid blockers, and anti-inflammatories. Take your prebiotic and your probiotic daily. And I have some examples of what your prebiotics are and what your probiotics are. Some of them you can, especially probiotics, some of them you can make yourself. So I think this is the end of my presentation. I hope that what I said is virtually impossible to cover everything about the gut because it's a lot of information there. God is concerned about us as well. He gave us this body. He knows how it works. And uh, we have messed it up due to taste. We want everything to be salt and sweet and high fat and all of that. And we don't want to exercise. So we, some of us are bearing the consequences of improper eating. And John said, he wants us to prosper and be in good health. When we're in good health, we can comfortably work for the master. But if we're not in good health, we can't go and walk and talk to people about their, their soul salvation. So we, he wants our souls, <clears throat> wants us to prosper and be in good health as our soul prospering. So we need to eat healthy, live, and stay healthy. Thank you. Um, Emily, you're muted. I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Josephine, for that wonderful presentation. <clears throat> you know, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Can you imagine? what goes on in our gut every day, trying to keep us healthy and to protect us from um, diseases. You know, our gut is the foundation of health. As Josephine said, our gut is the foundation. And if we have a healthy gut, we can have a healthy immune system. And especially in this day and age where we have all this virus and all of these things that are happening, it's so very crucial for us to maintain a healthy gut. And Josephine clearly explained to us some of the signs that, that are there to let us know if we are having an unhealthy gut, uh, if we have an unhealthy gut by you know, bloating and gas and constipation and those things, we can tell if our gut is uh, are healthy or not. So therefore, if we're experiencing these things, let us start now to try and get it, to fix it so that we can experience um, a healthy gut. And foods that are good for us are those foods that God created, that God gave us <clears throat> fruits and vegetables, whole grains, those are the things we need to consume so that we can maintain that balance in our gut so that we can maintain that healthy gut. I have a couple questions in the chat. And um, one of the questions, how can one know they have bad gut health? And how can you clean it up and make it good? As I pointed out, the, the, the signs and symptoms of a bad gut. Probably if you have it just for today, maybe it's something you ate and it's a once is is a once occurring thing. But if you have it today and you have it tomorrow or whatever. For example, the other day my my stomach was burning. And I wonder if it was a nut butter and my oatmeal. So I decided I'm not going to eat that. It happened more than one time. So I stopped eating it and the burning went away. So that's one way you can do that. But if it continues, 
you're not a doctor, you have to go seek some medical help from your doctor and work from there. But make sure you also talk to someone who cares about you to get to the root of the problem, not just give you something, a plaster to put on the sore and not addressing the cause of the sore. Mm -hmm. You know, gut problem is a big problem. As you mentioned, 70 million Americans, and this is not only Americans, people in other countries, 70 million Am Americans suffering with gut health. And one of the medications that is highly prescribed in, um, in America, and I'm sure to, in other countries, is um, anti-acid medications. And that's the worst medication I should, I should put it out there. Anyone to take if they're having gut problems um, because we need the acid of stomach to help digest our food. And, if, and, it's, and it's just gonna cause the, the reverse because when you have um, uh, decreased acidity in your stomach then you cannot digest your food properly. And then the food sits there longer and lingers and lingers and cause purification and cause you to have even more problems. So we have to have that balance. And as Josephine mentioned that she was having problems with, you know, she felt that she was having this burning. We have to know our system. We have to know that when something does not sit right with you, you, you eat something and you realize, you know something, what I just ate um, is not good for me. For example, bananas. If I, I cannot eat too many bananas because it will cause bloating and stuff like that. So I have to be very careful when I eat bananas. Um, so we have to take stock of how we feel, what's going on around us and realize, you know, that I have to change in order to help, in order to get good health. Um, I know some doctors out there, they have no clue what leaky gut is, because I have talked to my GI doctor about leaky gut and she was like, leaky gut. But there is something called leaky gut and we have to take it under control. That's why lots of people have irritable bowel syndromes. It's because of leaky gut. Food is getting into your bloodstream and leaking into your, um, into your system and causing you to have this inflammatory process and causing inflammation in your stomach. And that's why you have an irritable bowel syndrome and all of these different GI symptoms. If we can fix it all by our diet, and I guess Josephine mentioned about foods that are probiotic and prebiotics. That's so important for us to eat prebiotic foods and probiotic foods to help maintain that balance in our stuff, in our gut. Um, okay, saying thanks for the the tips. Um, I was going to ask Josephine um, about if you realize that you have a food sensitivity or there's something that's causing you to have problems when you have to eat it, <clears throat> um, do you have to stop eating that for the rest of your life? Or what can you do so that you can resume eating that food or foods? A person is, may have to stop eating it for the rest of their life based on the effect on their body. But I know that if you eat if you're eating something, a set of food together, you begin to feel sick. You don't know which food is causing the problem. So you have to start a process of elimination. Get to know the foods you eat. You can do some research and see the effects of those foods on the body and start a process of elimination. Maybe you're eating too much, too often. We have to cut back on the frequency. Like I like oatmeal a lot. So eat a lot of oatmeal frequently. So what I'm doing now, I am cutting back on the amount of time I eat oatmeal times I eat oatmeal. So you may have to do that. As I said, some people may not be able to, if it's an allergy reaction, which can be life-threatening, you may have to leave it alone. But if it's just an intolerance, you can, you may be able to incorporate it in your diet 
in between, not number once a week, twice a week, etc. Okay, so there's a difference between allergies and intolerance. Allergies, you will know right away that you're allergic to something, you have to stop it, you cannot eat that. But intolerance is very subtle and sometimes it might not affect you today, it might not affect you a day or two later. So that's why you have to look back and see what you ate a couple of days ago, why you're feeling this way today. Um, I noticed Alicia had a hand up. I have a um, question. Um, one of the things I saw in the in the thing here this evening is um the probiotics is sauerkraut, right? Um, can someone make sauerkraut without salt? Or oh, and kimchi, kimchi is something spicy, not so? Yes. Can you make those things without the, the, the added set of pepper and salt? Well, if they're going to bother you, because I know your, your condition, they have other things that you can use. But there's a salt that's called Celtic sea salt, which they claim does not affect you as the regular table salt. But to get the, the sauerkraut, I believe that the salt is important or I don't know if it's a substitute, another way to get the sauerkraut made without salt. So this is where we have to go and look and search and research or benefit. If something is going to bother you if you eat it, find a substitute that would agree with your condition. Mm -hmm. And then maybe after healing your gut, maybe you can add it slowly back into your diet, but you must heal your gut. Listen to your gut. You know, they talk about the second brain. Your gut is like your second brain. Sometimes you have that gut feeling. It, it is so true that our gut is like our second brain. Um, that brain gut connection is so important because what leaks out into, this, into the body goes, can go to the brain and cause inflammation and cause confusion and dementia and all of those things that can start happening. So that's why it's so important to keep those tight junctions together so we do not end up with a leaky gut and end up with other problems. So do you have to eat that um, probiotic every day, every single day? It's advisable to have it as part of your food. You can use different ones, different types, but, and if you eat the proper foods, you won't have to worry, but sometimes we don't eat the proper food, so we may have to add other things because our onions and garlic and all those things, they, they are good in themselves. Right, yes. Those are very good anti-inflammatory. Onions, garlic, excellent source of anti-inflammatory um, pro uh, properties. I have Moya. Moya, unmute yourself. You can ask your question. Yeah, yes, Karen. Um, I, I will ask it on behalf of Moya and myself. Um, the, this, the sleeping disturbances, we, could you all elaborate a little more on the sleeping disturbances and the cause a little more? That's, that's a very good question. Yeah, that's a very good question because yeah. that has a lot to do with good, with bad health. Josephine? But the general consensus is that you should go to bed by a certain time. 10 o'clock, they say. Two hours before midnight are vital for your body. Mm -hmm. You put down the laptop, you put down the phone at least an hour before you're ready to go to bed. You darken your room, you say your prayers, and you go to bed. And the hours between 11 and 3, they say it's a time when your body repairs itself. 
So turn off the lights, pull the curtain, put up dark curtains, darken your room. That's when your melatonin is made, your cells rejuvenate, and your body fixes itself from the torch of the thing that you put it under. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the gut, um, the gut problem, the, 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 the sleep <coughs> disturbances that are caused by the gut problem. Could you elaborate a little more on that, the gut? Yeah. You know, so one of the things with um, some people, they, they get up during the night. They just, can't, they just wake up. They just can't sleep. That could be a sign of bacteria overgrowth. Because what is happening while you're sleeping, these bacteria come out to eat. Mm. And then that causes your disturbance in your sleep and causes mm. you to, to wake up. Um, that could be a sign of overgrowth of candida, candida bacteria, candida. That's one of the things that happens when you have an overgrowth of candida. They're coming out by three o'clock so in the morning, you are wide awake for no reason at all can't go to sleep and go back to sleep. So mm -hmm. check that out, um, get um, a SIBO test. Mm -hmm. that, that's a, 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 a breathalyzer test that you can do to check to see if you have small intestinal um, bacterial overgrowth. That's what SIBO stands for. Um, so that's my understanding of what could happen when you have an overgrowth of bacteria, is it, it can cause sleep disturbance. I don't know if Josephine has anything else to add to that. Not that you don't have any bacteria in your small intestines. A lot of bacteria oh. are in your colon. Colon, I'm sorry. And if the ileocecal valve, the junction between the colon and the ileum is not working, because the, the, the ileum is there, the valve is there, shut that no bacteria can come from your colon and come and migrate into your small intestines. But if your gut is not working and that ileocecal valve isn't functioning, they're gonna migrate and come over into your small intestines and you're gonna be overgrowth. That's what it's a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There should not be so many in there. They don't have any cause in there. In there has its own set. set and the colon has its own set. So that's why you keep your gut intact. Yeah. So, so it's just like you have your kitchen, the kitchen sink, you don't want your sewer to be backing up into your kitchen sink because your kitchen sink is clean and sterile while, you know, sewer is where you have your waste. So did that answer the question, um, Pastor John? Um, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, Carol. Yes, because, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Yeah. Well, I think why he was asking because I think I'm going through that for the longest while now. I just just wake up and cannot go back to sleep. And to me, you know, you it's not a pain like what you're feeling, a little discomfort in your belly, or sometimes it's the other way around. I go into the bed sleepy and by the time you pray and settle down it's like the sleep gone you gotta go searching for it and you wouldn't go off to sleep till all about one two o'clock but you went in all around nine o'clock the sleep just gone your brain all over the place sometimes to get a little comfortable if i turn on my stomach i get to sleep much better as against if I sleep on my side. So what I hear this afternoon, it really give me a pop-up or an eye opener that I need. Well, I went to the doctor last week and I'm waiting on my results. They did a lot of blood work because I told him about the, about the um, insomnia, which um, two weeks ago, it lasted about eight days. Mm -hmm. So I'm waiting on the results. On Tuesday, I'm supposed to go back for those results. So this is what um, Sister Josephine said this afternoon is a real eye-opener. I, I get a better understanding on what might be happening. Right, yeah. 
Yes. Okay, Alicia, did you have your hands up again? Yeah, I was going to okay. ask, even if, if, even if you don't want to sleep at the time you're supposed to go to bed, you still lie down and um, put away whatever stuff you have, whether it be your phone or your tablet or whatever. Even if you don't want to sleep, I, uh, for me, I just try to go to bed by, by 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So, um, and sometimes I would just lie down and I don't want to sleep. And I would take up my iPad and leave me is if it's either listen to some music or look at some video on YouTube or whatever the case may be. And a um, few minutes after that, I would drop asleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, listening to a nice soothing um, yeah. music. We have to be very careful what music we listen to just in the, before going to bed or during or you know, yeah, well, I, I, I listen to nice, good Christian music. If I yes. go into and I put in on music, that is what I would put on, Christian music. And I would fall asleep, but my iPad now, um, when it when it will cut off itself. Yeah. If it realizes that I'm not, you know, in motion with it. And um, the thing about the iPad, we have that light that um, can I cause that penal, that penal gland to stay awake oh. where you will not be able to sleep. So you have to be careful. We should put away all electronics before going I to bed. Turn the light away from my face and, and try to turn my back to it. Or I would put you it supposed to top. have those things in your bedroom? <laughs> no TV, no electronics in your bedroom. When I put I put my phone and my iPad in my bed table drawer, plug out everything, no electrical thing is going on because that too can have an effect when you have things like that. Well these, these days for me I just I, I take off my phone by the time nine o'clock I, I switch my phone off. Mm -hmm. Airplane mode. I just take it completely off. Completely off. Okay. Anyway, yeah, EMS. Um, EMS. Yeah. Getting... So we are getting down to the wire here. This was such a wonderful discussion. I guess we're going to have to bring Josephine back so we can continue this conversation because oh, yeah. gut health is so very important. And there's so much areas that we can cover with gut health. Thank you, Josephine, for this excellent presentation. Um, as usual, if anyone has any, um, what you call it, prayer requests, you know, we're going to pray before we end our our um, presentation here. So, anyone with um, prayer requests? Any prayer requests? Me. Okay. Who was that? Oh, Moya. Alicia, okay, okay. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and pray and um, end our presentation. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this another day that you have given us where we can come to learn so much about our bodies, the, the body that you have created and give us so that we can take care of. Dear the Lord, I do pray for the things that we have heard today that we will put it into practice so that we can gain better gut health. I do pray for Alicia, dear God, you see, so you know her by name, nature, her condition, you know everything about her. I do pray that you will be with her, bless her, continue to encourage her and to direct her step in everything that she does. Dear God, I not only pray for her, but for everyone who's in this call, families and friends, wherever they are or wherever they might be. Be with us again in Jesus' name. Bring us back next week where we can hear more about um, taking care of our bodies. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Amen. 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 Amen.